Okay, well, it's uh, 1230 Eastern, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, my name is John Mann, and I'm an assistant professor here at Michigan State University, and I host this series, uh, Innovations in Agriculture and Rural Development, and the series is sponsored by the North Central Regional Center for Rural Development. So I want to welcome everybody to today's webinar, uh, UW-Madison's Animal Science Byproducts Initiative, Discovering Value in Animal Slaughter Byproducts. So before we start the presentation, uh, if you haven't done so, uh, just take a quick moment and uh, answer our poll questions. Your uh, feedback is uh, appreciated. And uh, if we um, miss a couple of folks on the poll questions, these will come up at the very end of the presentation, so you'll have a chance to do that. Um, also, uh, at the box to the lower right, I've got a couple of uh, uh, helpful links. Um, so my email, uh, Mark Cook's email, the uh, Innovations in Agriculture and Rural Development YouTube page, and also my uh, LinkedIn information. I've also put that in the uh, chat box below. So if you haven't connected with me on LinkedIn, please do so there. Um, and uh, we're recording this webinar, and the recording will be available on YouTube, and so I should have that posted uh, in the next day or so, and you can share that with uh, colleagues. Uh, if you'd like, you can also send me an email, and I can send you a reminder when that gets posted up. So finally, our presentation itself is going to be about 25 minutes uh, in length, and we'll have uh, room for about uh, 10 to 20 minutes worth of questions. And so as your questions come up, if you will go ahead and type them into the chat box below, and uh, I'm going to leave it up to Mark how we want to address these, but uh, we may uh, answer those uh, in process, or we'll get to them at the uh, conclusion of the presentation. So thank you again for your participation. Um, our presenter today is... Uh, Dr. Mark Cook, and he's a professor at the University of Wisconsin in Madison in the uh, Animal Science Department. His research focuses on novel dietary mechanisms to control inflammation and increase animal growth and development. Mark's the co-founder of four companies um, and has had uh, helped or he's helped bring innovative products for human, agricultural animals, and pet use uh, to market. So Mark also received uh, several awards for his entrepreneurial activity and recently chaired the construction and launch of the Discovery to Product, or D2P, at uh, UW-Madison, which is a $5.6 million platform for technology transfer. So in today's uh, presentation, Mark's going to share more with his efforts about uh, U-Madison's efforts related to animal science and byproducts initiatives. So Mark, take it away. Okay, thank you very much, John, and uh, welcome to everybody. I, I notice we have a nice blend of people from academia as well as uh, the private sector, which is great. Um, I can tell you, uh, I've been at Wisconsin for 33 years, and I really love bridging uh, that uh, connection to the private sector with academia. And, uh, and I'm just going to tell you a little bit about an initiative that uh, was put together on Madison's campus. Um, this, this initiative was really started uh, through the leadership of Dan Schaefer, the uh, chair of the Animal Sciences Department. Uh, but I want to go through a very specific example of um, our attempt to, to begin to make discovery and to try to move these discoveries to the private sector. So if you think of the meat industry, um, the slaughter of animals, I, I think everybody kind of thinks of uh, the, the key product uh, in the slaughter industry or the meat industry as being the edible product. Um, somewhere around 100 bit, billion pounds of meat is produced in the US each year. Uh, whether it's uh, poultry or swine or beef. Um, and a lot of that is not actually eaten, whether it's uh, inedible or it's uh, wasted food products uh, uh, during the, the processing to the, the final uh, consumer. And uh, we really feel that there's uh, value in those uh, uh, animal inedible as well as low-value products uh, in the uh, meat and, and perhaps even the egg sector of the poultry industry. Um, many of those byproducts uh, do get rendered. In other words, uh, the, the stuff that does not go into an edible stream 
gets ground up. It's um, put into a, uh, a vat. It's heated. Uh, very often the oils and fats are extracted off of it. And then um, uh, those are pretty low value products that can be used for things like soap, solvents, adhesives, uh, cosmetics. Uh, but our interest is really trying to find high value products that might actually exist in uh, these inedible byproducts. So when you think of uh, the slaughter of a, a ruminant, uh, you have all the intestinal material, G GI tract, lungs, spleen, all of this material is very often uh, ends up in the rendering part of, uh, of a plant. But those are the, the molecules that really kept that animal alive. And so there's very valuable molecules. If we could find out what to use them for, uh, perhaps we could uh, take those molecules uh, or complex compositions and come up with some novel uses. And that's kind of the, the whole background for the Animal Sciences uh, Bioproducts Initiative. Um, this all started uh, when uh, campus, UW-Madison's campus, decided it was time to build a new meat science laboratory on campus. Uh, we did not want to just build a, a traditional meat lab, uh, but we really wanted to identify what were the big needs um, in the slaughter industry uh, going forward. And so uh, Dan Schaefer, chair of the animal science department, began to uh, bring in different people from industry uh, to talk about the opportunities that might exist in, in the byproducts or bioproducts area. And we had a series of meetings on campus exploring uh, the possibility of, of a starting initiative in this new muscle biology or meat lab that was going to be built on campus. Um, right now, we, we haven't broke ground on this building, but we're in the final phases. Uh, the money has been raised and put together, or almost completely put together, uh, to begin this process. And one of the things we'll have in this uh, lab will be uh, the presence of uh, uh, bioproducts capacity. So if you kind of think about, okay, what are some of the big home runs in the area of bioproducts? Um, I, I just list two uh, right here. One is heparin. It's about a $4 billion uh, uh, market share uh, globally. Uh, heparin's used, of course, uh, as an anticoagulant. So every time you go to the uh, doctor's office and they take a, a tube of blood, uh, uh, some of those tubes, at least the ones with the green tops, have heparin in it that prevents the blood for, from coagulating so that they can run certain types of tests uh, on, on those blood samples. And of course, heparin can be used in, in the patient itself uh, to prevent the formation of blood clots. Another market, it's not so much uh, associated with uh, many of the agriculture animals that we deal, it, we deal with, uh, but from shellfish are the glucosamines. Um, which is currently globally about a $2 billion industry. So these are very specific molecules uh, that can be found associated with some form of animal processing or slaughter. And there's hundreds, if not thousands, of other potential molecules. And all we have to do is find out what they are, how much is there, can we get to them re relatively easily, and find unique uses for these products. So when we were kind of going through this process, um, uh, we worked with Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation, which is a private foundation associated with uh, University of Wisconsin. They're a patenting uh, foundation to try to explore to see if uh, there were people globally that were really uh, digging into these animal byproducts to find uh, new molecules and new uses for some of the animal byproducts. And it was clear that there were very few novel patents uh, that were issuing in this area. So heparin, uh, there are no active patents 
on the the original use of heparin or glucosamine. Those patents have all expired. I'm sure there's there's some uh, uh, maybe niche patents that exist, but it was clear to us that a lot of the work on uh, bioproducts probably occurred um, maybe 20, 30, 50 years ago. And with uh, some of the new technologies we had that uh, this really needs to be explored again. And there was really no national initiative focused on creating valuable byproducts from animal by, uh, byproducts. And so uh, this looked like a, a good focus that we could initiate, at least with the development of our uh, new meats lab on campus. So this is kind of um, a general setup of how we, we began to envision this university industry partnership working together. And I'm, I'm really hopeful that uh, uh, people in, at other universities will, will actually develop similar uh, uh, operations to the one we've put together. And so the ideas for these new products um, really originate in our minds, not necessarily with the industry, uh, but actually uh, originate with scientists, uh, researchers uh, on campuses, um, where the university is not maybe testing a product that's made by industry, but the university and the academy is actually creating novel ideas from prior art, things that we already know, know about, or perhaps brand new knowledge that is just coming forward. Um, identifying problems or, or niches where new products uh, from the slaughter industry may, may actually fix problems um, that nobody has thought about. And so to kind of give you an example, uh, we sit around a table here in our building uh, with grad students, uh, postdocs, and scientists, just brainstorming what, what are some of the molecules? We know most of the molecules that are, are in animals. What are some of those molecules that we could isolate? And what would we use it for? What type of market um, or what type of problem could we actually uh, take these products and try to solve? Now, once the idea is, is put to, together, um, at least my group uh, begins to, to actually do market analysis. Uh, we, wanna, we always have plenty of ideas. We want to kill these ideas as fast as we can so that we don't go down a, a blind alley. And so we, we want to look at uh, what are the markets, uh, the problems that we'll solve, and in our case, do we really have the expertise to, to work in this particular area? If we don't have the expertise, then perhaps we should give it to somebody else and let them work on it or, or set up a team uh, to work. In fact, one of these happened yesterday uh, where uh, the, the student brought in a great idea and I said, yeah, it's a great idea, but we don't have the expertise. Uh, we need somebody else that will take that idea and perhaps move forward with it. So before we even pick up a pipette, uh, uh, we, we begin to look for uh, help in working together with some type of industry sponsor. And uh, this went real hand in hand as we were beginning to talk to different uh, 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 producers of meat products. Uh, that were uh, processing animals and selling meat that, you know, you have some products that may be uh, in your buy stream or byproduct stream that have as much value as, as the pig itself or the, the cow itself or the chicken. And we would like to explore those with you. We have a couple of ideas. And uh, really what we're looking for in, in uh, academia is we have to have funding to move this forward just like somebody in the private sector would. And uh, so we, we don't try to get grant funding 
The funding that we're looking for is what I call benchmark funding. In other words, I, I show three phases, phase one, two, and three. Let's, um, let's do some initial work uh, with industry uh, sponsorship covering the cost of it. And I give an example. Uh, let's, let's figure out if we can collect this molecule, can we fractionate it? What kind of uh, quantity can we produce? Is it safe? And can we produce this product in a cost-effective manner to fit a particular market need? Um, now, the truth of the matter is industry is not just going to give the university any money. Um, industry doesn't do that unless there's something in return. And so the way we have it set up on Madison's campus is we operate under a research agreement um, which involves the intellectual property. So as we march through a phase one uh, to a phase two, which involves uh, some preclinical testing um, and, and trying to find novel use of, of these molecules, uh, we file patents, uh, which actually provides value back to the industrial sponsor. And in the case of uh, University of Wisconsin, we have WARF, our patenting uh, agency. And even before the industrial sponsor uh, uh, funds anything or we pick up the first pipette, the WARF relationship with industry is already established. So we know how the uh, intellectual property is going to be used in, in going forward. So in my group, we have a, a very, very specific set of criteria by which we look at these slaughter products. And uh, I think uh, the, the other two re researchers on our campus follow a, a similar set of criteria. And so we cannot operate broadly in this marketplace. That's why we need so many more scientists uh, doing similar type of work. First of all, we, we try to identify the byproduct uh, that has some form of value. Um, and so there are a lot of byproducts that uh, really don't have value or we cannot identify at this time a, a potential value. And so we're scratching through the, the various molecules and, until we can find one that has a potential market uh, the market is, is big enough as, as far as its size uh, and the cost of solving a particular problem is great enough that we can afford to collect this material and uh, produce this material in, at some level of purity uh, to meet that market need and still have the cost of producing the product being less than the value. Because, of course, somebody in the private sector has to make money. And I can tell you the truth that there, there are some products that we come across that there's just no way you're going, going to find a value um, relative to the cost of collection. So you have to kill those rather quickly. The other thing that we look for in our laboratory is uh, products that um, can only be isolated and uh, they cannot be made by other means, or it's, it'd be cost pro prohibitive to make them by other means. So let me give you an idea. If we were to chase insulin, for example, um, insulin, of course, was, was a product that we produced from animal byproducts for many years. But today we can make insulin much cheaper using um, uh transgenic organisms and produce it through fermentation. So those are not molecules that we would actually chase because they could be produced through some other advanced uh, science techniques. Now, there are some examples where we might chase one of those if we thought that there was a higher value in the natural form of that product. Uh, but in many cases, uh, uh, there is not a market for the natural form of that product. And so it's not worth chasing certain types of hormones or, or uh, growth factors that, that you could isolate from the, the stream 
but you can make them cheaper some other way. The other requirement we have in our lab is that um, the products that we're looking for need to be compatible with our capability, or at least if, if we're going to work with collaborators, uh, the capability of other collaborators. Otherwise, we should just give the idea away to somebody else. Um, my group is, is well recognized for our work in, in areas like inflammatory disease. Uh, replacement for antibiotics. Uh, so these are the types of products that we're going to be looking for um, that are very specific to our, our focal area. Um, and we need other people that have other skill sets to chase these other products. And so the product, our goal is to find at least one high value use of the product and the product needs to be reasonably safe. Uh, so we don't start any, any type of uh, 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 product production until we can answer these, qu these questions very clearly in our laboratory. So I thought I'd give you an example. Um, there's a need in animal agriculture to protect gut barrier function. So the, this is a, a problem that... Um, uh, scientists, as well as our group, has identified that uh, in, in animals, as well as humans, there are conditions where the gut gets leaky to, for a variety of different reasons, and uh, you can get infections that occur, or you can get certain types of allergies that occur because of uh, a leaky gut. And so we were interested in, in uh, looking at the animal that has successfully protected its gut barrier function to see if we could find molecules that had value. So this is a, a picture of kind of uh, what I call the conventional uh, gastrointestinal tract of, of, of an animal. So you have uh, the yellow stars, which are the immune system. So the immune system is located along here. This is the wall of the intestinal tract. You have the lumen of the intestine with bacteria and a variety of different nutrients. And then you have the, the muscle portion, which is the portion that is used for uh, or represents the animal growth. So in a conventional animal, the bacteria are constantly interacting with the immune system. And you get a variety of different immune products that are produced. Uh, these products, whenever you have an immune reaction, you get collateral damage. Uh, so uh, under this condition, the gut can become leaky and the nutrients have to be used for repairing the, uh, the gastrointestinal tract damage because of the immune system, feeding the immune system, in some cases, um, feeding the bacteria themselves. So there's less muscle or less nutrients for growth. And um, so we were trying to come up with a strategy, a solution where we could create a barrier that was between the immune system and the, the organisms that are within the gastrointestinal tract that would actually reduce the inflammatory response in the gut and increase the nutrient available for muscle growth and development. So that's been a kind of a strategy and in, in the basis for the development of a number of the products that we currently have in the marketplace. Well, there's a molecule called secretatory immunoglobulin A. This, we all produce this. Every animal produces SIGA. This is a molecule that is secreted into our intestine, and its sole pur purpose is to act as a barrier against things in the, test in the intestine from leaking across the intestinal wall and contacting the immune system and causing inflammation. So because SIGA is an antibody, it literally binds to everything that's, uh, that 
exist in, in the gastrointestinal tract. And we produce gram quantities of this, depending on the animal size. Uh, larger animals produce more grams of the product. And when it binds to these uh, food antigens or bacteria or viruses or whatever it, it binds, uh, it does not cause inflammation. It actually reduces inflammation in the gastrointestinal tract, partly because it, it prevents the interaction of the immune system with uh, the pot potential immune stimulants within the gastrointestinal tract. And it re reduces the possibility of, of uh, things in the gastrointestinal tract translocating, causing systemic infection. And I'll show you an example of uh, potential uh, skin disorders. So we had decided that this was a molecule that does not exist in the marketplace. Nobody is producing uh, large quantities of SIGA that it possibly would solve our problem. And we thought we could segregate the processing, the slaughter process to collect these molecules. And so we approached a company to see if uh, they would be interested in working with us. So I'm not gonna show you a lot of data, but I can just tell you that uh, we did make a product it's uh, not a highly pure product, although we have made highly pure uh, products as well, or highly pure SIGA. Uh, but the product that we uh, produced is a product called Cosatine. And uh, we've been in uh, large trials uh, beginning to understand uh, the market need and the market use of this product. So two of the discovered uses of this product uh, which focus strictly on animals, although we'll begin doing uh, preclinical human tr trials with the uh, highly purified molecules as well, was uh, broiler withdrawal feeds. So let me describe broiler withdrawal feeds. So typically we raise broilers anyway. This is the meat type chicken, uh, somewhere around 45 days to 60, 62 days, depending on the size of the bird you want. Uh, we continue to use antibiotics in, in uh, much of the poultry production. Uh, some of these are coccidia stats to control um, uh, protozoan diseases. And to make sure that these no longer are associated with the, uh, the animal meat, we have to go through a withdrawal period. And so the final feed that the animal eats um, contains no antibiotics, uh, no chemicals or drugs, uh, which allows the animal uh, not to have any residual uh, antibiotics or drugs when it goes into the slaughter plant. Well, this can represent anywhere from 30% to almost 45% of the feed that the chicken consumes. It could be the last two weeks of the chicken's life, but it's because the birds are bigger and growing, it represents a major por portion of their feed. And I'll show you an example of some, just a little bit of data of how this product worked in, in that area. The other area that we found this product worked was in animal dermatitis. And um, uh, some people call it atopic dermatitis. It's a, a very common problem in laboratory mice, you say, well, there's not a market in laboratory mice. Well, I'm going to show you there is one. It affects somewhere between 2 to 10 million dogs per year in the U.S. And I'm, I'm sure if you've been around dogs very long, you know of dogs that have had uh, uh, skin lesions or dermatological lesions that had to be treated with uh, steroids. And actually, uh, humans, one out of a thousand humans, um, have low production of SIGA. Uh, so there was potential market in, in humans as well. So let me just show you um, not our data, uh, but independent verification on our cosatine in a, a broiler diet. So, of course, we do a lot of our initial research on campus. We get patent protection. 
And then we have to go to uh, contract labs uh, to really get somebody to independently verify the usefulness of, of these products. And the group we used is a, a company called Virginia Diversified Research. Of course, they're in Virginia, a highly respected uh, a company that, that tests most of the uh, feed additives that are used in, in the broiler industry in the United States. Uh, real quickly, uh, this was done in Harrisburg. We had like 12 pens of uh, 30 chickens. Um, and we had two groups. One group was fed the uh, control diet, and the other group was fed cosetine at a quarter pound per ton. And um, just measured primarily weight gain, feed efficiency, and mortality in these birds. So this is an example of the type of data we were getting. Again, we had done probably 30 experiments before we got to this dose level and this particular design. Uh, but in this uh, sizable study, uh, if you look under feed over gain, uh, 42 days to 60 days, that's the withdrawal feeds, uh, you can see that we dropped uh, the feed needed per unit gain from 2.41 to 2.32 doesn't look like a lot. Uh, it is significant. We did get a little bit of a growth response. So we got about uh, 0.15 uh, pounds of additional body weight uh, as well. But I'll show you how something that small, that feed efficiency, adds up to be create a very valuable product. Now remember in the Withdrawal diets, you don't have antibiotics. So you, you don't have anything that will serve as a growth promoting in that, that last feed, which represents as much as 45% of the animal's feed. So here's a calculation, just using the numbers I had before, uh, standardizing to an 8.5 pound broiler. Uh, we could get a feed savings of 0.76 pounds per chicken. Uh, that's worth about nine cents a chicken. Well, when you begin to realize that we produce nine billion broilers in the U.S., uh, 40 billion uh, worldwide, at uh, nine billion, the value of that product, gross value, is uh, uh, in the neighborhood of $810 million a year. Uh, assuming that every broiler operation would respond similar. And so what we have done is, is taken this particular product and actually uh, field tested this with broiler integrators. And we continue to do that, show them, showing them how they can uh, value uh, uh, from this particular product. In the area of dermatitis, we took the same exact product, the isolated SIGA, and we happen to have a, a mouse model for dermatitis. It's a very interesting mouse model. It's kind of similar to the atopic dermatitis in both dogs and, and children. And this one is actually induced by a diet change. So the mice are fed a, a certain diet. We change the protein type in the diet and they break with this uh, skin lesion. Uh, it looks very similar to uh, some of the skin lesions we see in dogs and children. And uh, so the dermatitis begins with the diet change. Um, there's increased inflammatory disease that we see in the intestine. And one of the things we saw in these mice is they start producing large quantities of SIGA which indicated to us, even though they're producing it, you'd say, well, adding more SIGA shouldn't help. It's an indicator that they're having a gut barrier dysfunction. And uh, so by providing an exogenous source of SIGA that's made to a broad class of molecules, uh, we thought we could actually protect against this disease. This is very relevant because um, IgA deficiency has been shown to be associated with respiratory infections, GI disorders, 
and atopic topic dermatitis in humans. Um, it's known that um, atopic derm dermatitis in children uh, is uh, associated with low productions of SIGA, and as well as in dogs, uh, there's a negative correlation between the amount of serum IgA and atopic dermatitis. So we had a clear market. We could produce uh, the molecule. And so we began to test it in our mouse model that we had. And so this uh, just shows you a little bit of data in our mouse model. We call it ulcerative dermatitis in mice. Uh, the controls would have 100% when we make the diet change. Uh, we had uh, two levels of this product, and you can see we got a dose decrease in the incidence of dermatitis. So we were preventing dermatitis. Um, I don't have the control in this particular slide, the negative control, but you can see after we fed the pr product uh, beginning at time zero, we induce the dermatitis by changing the protein in the diet. And you can see at about week, week three, when the animals are making uh, certain types of antibodies, uh, you get an increase in the scratching in these animals. So uh, the ones in the red bars are those that are fed a one-third dose of the SIGA and the blue bars were fed a full dose of the SIGA. So we were able to reduce the scratching uh, that was occurring in these animals. Well, here's an image of um, mice that actually had dermatitis. And what we showed that we could take the mice that had already developed the dermatitis, put them on the SIGA, uh, given them barrier function, and these mice would actually recover. This one's a little harder to see on the left. Uh, you can see a lesion there, but that lesion completely healed um, after uh, the mice were given the SIGA. We then did a dog study. Um, uh, this study was done in beagles. Uh, beagles don't get atopic dermatitis on the skin like some dogs. Um, but they develop another type of dermatitis, which is called interdigital dermatitis. And we looked at the change in the interdigital uh, dermatitis uh, during the course of a study with uh, beagles. And you can see we got a marked reduction in the advancement of dermatitis in, in the beagle dogs. So we'll probably be taking this product into a couple of different markets. I have to tell you, this mouse market has me really intrigued. Um, so the mouse called the Black Six Mouse, we use in research laboratories 6.5 million of these a year in our research. And about uh, somewhere around uh, 4 or 5% of those mice will break with atopic dermatitis. So about a quarter of a million of these mice uh, break with this disease. When that occurs, we have to euthanize the mouse. These are not cheap mice. The mice are actually cost us about $20 a mouse. Um, and in some cases, uh, a mouse can cost us as much as $8 a mouse. So if I'm running an experiment and all of a sudden they break with atopic dermatitis, I have to euthanize that mouse. Uh, not only do I lose the value of that animal, but I also could lose my entire exper experiment. Just the gross value in that market is about uh, $5 million a year um, uh, just in the loss of the mice due to atopic dermatitis. So this is one of the markets uh, that we're exploring with this product. <laughs> so I wanted to give you a feel for the types of things uh, we're working on other products as well uh, since we started this, um, but not just my group. Uh, there are two other groups and a third one that's going to join up soon that are working on similar uh, uh, projects with different companies. Uh, just read and uh, Chris Kruger's uh, group. Uh, they also work on mucosa immunology as well as, as some 
plant byproducts, not just slaughter byproducts, and they work on cardiovascular disease. And um, they have uh, uh, set up some partnerships uh, with uh, the private sector, uh, developing unique molecules uh, that also could have value. Um, so we're actually working in, in the same space, but their molecules are very different than the molecules uh, that my group works with, and they're solving different problems. Um, Mark Richards' group, Mark is in the muscle biology group here on campus. Uh, Mark works mainly in the area of antioxidants, and, um, and Mark has uh, developed a number of technologies in the antioxidant field. So animal byproducts, I think, are a gold mine uh, of molecules to solve current problems in animal and human medicine. And, uh, and I really think that some of these molecules are more valuable than the animal meat itself. Uh, but we just need to go out there and find these and, and begin to work with the industry to develop some of these new products. That's it, John. Okay, thank you, Mark. That uh, presentation, very interesting. So for those of you in the audience with your questions, again, we've got the chat box uh, set up. And so if you will uh, type those questions in on the uh, lower right um, and then hit enter, those questions will appear. Uh, Mark, why, uh, while our audience is uh, thinking about their questions, I've got a couple for you. So uh, the first is, is related to the industries. And so what sort of industries are critical in the market to make the technologies work? Yeah, so um, actually in, in a couple of the products that we've been working on, um, uh, for example, in our S SIGA process, we were literally making this in test tubes. Um, as we scaled this up to, to make larger quantities of the process, uh, we needed uh, capacity in, in separations, where, whether it was uh, larger scale centrifuges, uh, pasteurization technology, uh, storage tanks, cooling technology. A big problem we have run into in, uh, in the mid Midwest is spray dryer capacity or, or drying capacity in general. And so uh, we continue to, to rely very heavily on industry, even as we scale up our, our research production. Uh, we have to work with different sectors uh, from, uh, you know, separation to packaging in order to, to move these forward. Uh, we also have to use, work with people in, in the area of uh, safety, which is microbial analysis of these products. Are in some cases, working with individual producers to actually get uh, uh, tests done with these products. Cool. Thank you for that. Um, it looks like we've got a question from uh, Julia. Uh, she asks, can you expand a little more on your past successes, failures from uh, industry collaboration? So what, what kind of experiences have you had doing that? So, um, I've had some <clears throat> very big successes working with industry. Um, and Julie, I don't know your background, uh, but um, uh, what I have found from an academic standpoint in working with people in industry, I, I really need to work with a visionary. Um, so I tend not to uh, uh, initially uh, have my champion as another scientist in the industry. I, I prefer to work with the, the owner of a company or, or somebody who, who has the ability to, to make decisions. Um, and, and that's always worked for me quite well. If, if I get down to the uh, science level, very often um, you know, the projects just don't move forward as smoothly as somebody who's more in the business side, who can really make decisions on the business side. And so I, I would say in working with industry, you've got to find a champion and, uh, and, and a visionary. And that will really determine uh, 
the, the likelihood that this uh, type of technology will move forward. I hope that answers your question. Uh, thank you for that. Um, so from Juan, a couple of questions. The first, any idea on the market value of existing products that are isolated from livestock uh, byproducts? So I know you touched on a couple, uh, maybe some other examples. Yeah, so let me say that uh, if, if we take uh, the, the two that I listed, heparin and, um, and glucosamine, so those are home runs, but uh, they're, they're very quickly becoming commodity type products. Uh, so they're very expensive to manufacture. The cost of making uh, human grade products um, is, is very high and there are multiple players. So the uh, return on investment on those, those products today is quite low. And uh, even though the actual uh, gross sales is high, uh, they're quite low. So many of the other products that I think have, have spun out of the byproducts industry have largely been replaced uh, through other uh, modern techniques uh, of manufacture. Uh, most of the hormones uh, have been replaced through uh, much easier ways to manufacture these products you know, cheaper. Um, so it's hard to get an estimate and I haven't bought uh, some of the very expensive uh, analyses on some of these products to, to get a handle on uh, what the value is. But I can tell you that if you can find a product that's novel, like the SIGA. Nobody's made probably no more than five grams of SIGA uh, ever. And you can find a use for uh, a thousand kilograms of SIGA, a novel use for it. And you can get patent protection. Uh, the return on investment could be quite large. Uh, and uh, it could be a very lucrative business uh, for, for a number of people involved in that production. Okay, thanks for that. Um, so uh, from, from Julie again, so she says thanks, but also uh, I think she's more curious about some potential pitfalls. And then uh, uh, I guess the uh, industry collaboration, what kind of, what are some of the, the potential pitfalls that you've encountered or maybe worked through? Yeah, so I, I can tell you, first of all, um, uh, you know, there's going to be one group that has the idea. In our case, the idea comes from the academic side. Um, so it's very, very important that uh, uh, the relationship before any money is exchanged, that the relationship between academia and industry is crystal clear. And so uh, in our case, uh, that relationship involves two relationships. Uh, the relationship with Wharf, who's gonna manage the intellectual property, has to be crystal clear. Also, the relationship with the industry has to be crystal clear. Another important uh, uh, component uh, involves confidentiality. Uh, in academia, we tend, you know, our mission is to publish information. Um, but we don't have to publish it as soon as it becomes knowledgeable to us. We do have to publish it. We have to put it in a public domain. Uh, so industry would be very concerned if we uh, prematurely released certain types of information. And so uh, in our case, our first publications of the information is in the form of patent publications, which actually can happen faster than even papers, uh, because once you submit a patent, it's published in 18 months. Some of my papers take longer than that. So... Um, uh, so pitfall would be a, a break of confidence with, with a private sector, uh, could, be, could be a major problem. Uh, but I really think if you have everything clearly defined in the very beginning, uh, the, those pitfalls will, will not be a problem. As long as you have the right person 
involved both in academia as well as in, um, in the private sector working on this together. If you don't, it's a pitfall and it's going to fall apart. And, and I've had those fall apart because it was just not the right matchup between the two. So it's got to be a real partnership. Another big pitfall is, um, is especially for the college professor, is to uh, think of this as a grant. So uh, the private sector is going to fund this research. But if you think of it as a grant, uh, it's a disaster. This funding is benchmark funding. And so very of often, you, you cannot think of this funding uh, for funding a grad student. Uh, so I tend to have either postdocs or scientists that work on, on these products. And uh, so it could be that you get through phase one, which is a six months um, uh, project, maybe only sixty seventy thousand dollars and the project's killed. Um, and you have to move on to the next thing. Um, or you could be in your phase two, which is a, a significantly more money and uh, and you bring in a team and uh, you have to kill the project. Uh, it's very critical that you're prepared to be able to kill it. If, if you don't meet, meet the benchmarks. So honesty becomes a, a big issue as well. So I think those are the key uh, pitfalls uh, that, that could disrupt uh, these types of industry, uh, academic type of, of relationships. And Julia, if you have any other questions, feel free to uh, either call me or email me and uh, we can talk more. Sometimes it's easier that way. Okay, thanks for that. Um, so uh, a question f from Randy, um, how many v revisions of the technology does it take to get it into the market uh, with byproducts? Um, it looks like he also has a comment on the time frame. So it looks like maybe a process of uh, from the discovery to, to where the technology is actually in a place to be commercialized and maybe a, a time frame on that. Yeah, so so very often it depends upon regulatory issues. So uh, the the products that I tend to work on um, are not very often do not fall under uh, complex regulatory issues like requiring FDA uh, types of approvals. Uh, these are grass products. Um, they're they're literally food products. Uh, that are going to be um, uh, used in a novel means. So um, the research will probably take, if you're aggressive, you can you could probably find one market within a year. Um, and then it might take another year to get some core data so that you can go out to the industry. In some cases, I've gone out even earlier with the industry and, and done field testing. Uh, so a couple of years maybe in the research. Um, uh, then, then the big question is, uh, who, who's going to actually move this product forward? They have to decide, are we going to go under a, a grass, generally recognized as safe type product with a, a American Feed Control official's uh, definition of a nutrient? Or is this product going to have to go through uh, some type of regulatory um, mechanisms such as the uh, biologics in USDA or possibly FDA. So uh, USDA biologics could take, um, you know, a, a, a couple of years to go through. Through If you had to go through FDA, you're running about five to seven years after you already know the product works and, and uh, is a useful product. So it really depends uh, how you you uh, structure what type of claims that you want uh, will determine how quick. So regulatory is probably two to three times the length of time to, to actually find a, a means of isolating and, and a use of the product. That's been my experience. Okay, thank you for that. So uh, it looks like I may get the last question. Um, so you touched on this a little bit, Mark, but would you maybe expand just a little bit on uh, the methods that you uh, employ to get the private industry to actually fund the technologies? 
Yeah, so I hit on this a little bit, and um, and I think this this is uh, in probably an important message both both for people in the private sector as well as academia. The private sector has to have value, and um, they're not going to pump money into a research type product unless they know that there is something in return for it. Uh, they're not philanthropists. And so the best way to give um, uh, somebody in the private sector value for their product is either trade secrets or patents. Um, in the case of academia, we're, we're not a trade secret type of organization, although there probably could be some trade secrets that would go with the technology. So uh, we're in the business in academia of uh, uh, publishing knowledge. And so um, the, the best way that we can give to the private sector is uh, uh, patented technology technologies uh, that they can license um, so that they can they can have the capacity to operate exclusively to develop that product in that market um, without some form of uh, value for the industry uh, I think it's very naive to think that industry would fund any types of uh, discovery in, in this particular market niche that's been my experience Okay, well, Mark, thank you for that. Um, so I've uh, changed the screen for those of you that didn't get a chance to fill out our poll questions. And uh, in uh, wrapping up, again, uh, we will have a link to this webinar posted on our YouTube page. And uh, you can scroll. You can either look at the, uh, the box to the lower right, and we've got that information there, or scroll through the, uh, the chat box to the very top, and I've got the YouTube page there. Um, I want to say thanks again to our presenter, uh, Dr. Mark Cook from University of uh, Wisconsin in Madison, and, and uh, also thank for you, thanks to you in the audience for participating. Mark, before we uh, officially wrap up, do you uh, have any parting thoughts? No, I, I, John, I just want to uh, tell you thank you for uh, uh, hosting the, to these types of activities. I, I welcome anybody who would like to contact me and, and visit more about this and, and uh, talk. Uh, uh, whether in the private, I work very closely in the private sector as well as in the public sector. Um, or if you see opportunities to, to interface with the, the types of things that we're doing, uh, whether you're in academia or, or somewhere else, uh, we'll probably, I think Dan Schaefer is hoping to put together a symposia uh, on Madison's campus in this particular area. So uh, sometime in the future, uh, we may have some type of symposia uh, that deals with uh, the, the bioproducts initiative that we have on campus and would welcome anybody to, to join that symposia. Okay, fantastic. Well, thank you for that. And uh, again, thank you, uh, thank you to our audience for participating. And with that, we'll uh, wrap up this webinar.